Hey all, it's Scott here again from Art of the Genre, and it is Science Fiction Thursday, where we will be taking a look at the classic Star Frontiers module, SFKH2, The Mutiny on the Eleanor Morais, um, which is a great little module by uh, Ken Ralston. Um, and it starts uh, a series called Beyond the Frontier, uh, and there are three in that set, uh, the, the second one being uh, The Face of the Enemy and the third being The War Machine. Um, all these are great. Uh, this particular one is probably my favorite in the series uh, as it deals a lot with uh, different terrains. And I think um, it is set up in such a way that it lends itself to being a great convention module. Uh, if this is ever going to be run at a convention, it's, it's the perfect... Uh, system for that. It's the perfect setup for it. Um, but before we get into it, uh, I'll just go into a little bit. This was produced in 1984. Um, 1984, I think, was just at the height, um, just as maybe we're getting to the downslide of the epicness of TSR. Um, Gygax is still involved in TSR at this time, uh, although he is in California. But I think money was still being generated and pumped into Star Frontiers at this point, especially with the release of the Nighthawks series. So um, that is something that you have to take into effect here because you get more art in this particular module than you get in most. It is covered by Larry Elmore. Take a look. And I love this cover. I think it's a great uh, representation of Elmore's work. Uh, he defined Star Frontiers, of course, went by doing the cover of Alpha Dawn uh, and Nighthawks for that matter. But uh, Alpha Dawn really, I think, helped define it. And you get a lot of the things that you see in his work here uh, with the gloves and the laser pistols. Uh, the masks in here are good. And he, he has a classic representation of the Azarian, um, which I think he obviously defined for the setting and for the game. Um, but really what I would talk about here, if I wanted to talk about art, and I do, uh, is a lot of people consider Dave Trampier to be one of the greatest artists to have ever graced any product in Dungeons and Dragons history. I'm not going to debate that because I actually absolutely love his work. Um, and obviously he did great things like the original player's handbook cover. Uh, and he does a lot of uh, other smaller interior works. And then, of course, in Dragon Magazine, he did the uh, Wormy comic, which I think is fantastic. What a lot of people don't know about Dave when they're looking about the overall encompassing uh, effects of his work or what he worked on um, at TSR, a lot of people don't know that he worked on Star Frontiers. But this particular mo uh, module is just chock full of his work. And it's some of the best stuff I've ever seen. Um, especially in the Star Frontiers genre. I've seen some like pieces that have been done by other artists, obviously not pieces that were used in the system, but uh, homage pieces or pieces that the people wanted to do that are very, very good. Uh, but still, I think this is one of the best things that you'll ever see, so much so that I'm going to go through them. I'm going to grab my notes, and I just want to take you through this. And before I do, I also want to tell you that uh, Steve Sullivan did the maps in this, which are great. Uh, here is just a, a composite piece of the Eleanor Moraes. And I think Steve did some great work in this. He's got some topographical maps. There are more uh, work there for the other decks of the Moraes as well. So keep that in mind. You're going to have a very good outlay of the maps of the uh, what's going on here. And like I said, a lot of this has to do with terrain. But I'm going to take you through Trampier's work because I just don't want to gloss over it because it's great. It takes you right through the entire adventure. So I'm going to go through it. One is the down balloon. Two is the river rapids. Three is the River Fording, which has a jelly belly in it. If you look it up in the module, it's kind of hidden in there, the drow site stepping on it. Uh, number four is going to be the Hounds. The Hounds is a great piece, but it's actually um, two pieces that are uh, uh, set up between a piece uh, of the module that's supposed to be taken out. So I only got one section of it. The other section has a great uh, piece of a drow site turning around and you get to see more of the Vrusk in it. Uh, then there is five, which are the paragliders. And then you have uh, the instrument. The instrument's kind of cool because I think it lends its lot, of, lot, lot of the stuff that it has to it. Kind of his wormy uh, works. There's a definitely his kind of comic style to it. And lastly, um, there is the island assault. 
So from those, I think you're going to get a great understanding of what Dave did on this and how many pieces. He's also got another piece with some monsters in the back. Um, but that is a lot of art for a, uh, a Star Frontiers adventure, especially when you're talking about you're moving into the mid-80s where art starts to go zoop. Uh, not bad art, but just less of it. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. If you like Dave's work, this is something to take a look at. It will absolutely inspire you to play Star Frontiers. So that's one of the, one of the things I love about this. Um, anyway, let's get into the module itself. Uh, like I said, it lends itself very well to a, uh, a convention module because it is all based around time. It's about, uh, I think, 35 hours is what the, the characters have to successfully complete this mission. Um, and you've got a really good um, uh, setup where you have uh, good maps of topography. Um, and those are, uh, there's also a wilderness chart, which is going to randomly generate what is going to be in each one of the hexes that the, uh, characters will be moving through to get back to the Eleanor Marais. Uh, the, the venture starts with you being in kind of an air, uh, an airship that gets shot down. Um, it was a survey, it gets shot down by a robot from the Eleanor Marais, from the mutineer named Terry, who was the first mate and that ship crashes, you have to paraglide out of it, and then you have to salvage what you can from it, um, taking care of the captain who's on board and an engineer who's on board who have been uh, very badly wounded. Their stamina is permanently reduced um, until they can get to a different facility. So you kind of have to leave them there, there, lock them in the gondola, and then make your way back to the Marais, which is, um, Terry has told everyone that he believes that this world is an Eden, uh, it should not be corrupted uh, by the, you know, humanity or any of the other races. Uh, and that, unfortunately, you're the ones that are going to have to pay the price for that because he's going to leave you here. Uh, but he can only leave you here after he overhauls the last uh, atomic engine on the Marais, which is going to take him a few hours. Um, so the characters are in a race to get back to the Marais and recapture it, take it back from Terry, um, before it takes off and leaves them permanently stranded on this planet. So keep that in mind. Um, the air on the planet is mildly toxic, so everyone is wearing rebreathers. Um, and then you have to continue to make your way um, through different sets. There are 24 um, in possible encounters on the trip back. That is not to say that you couldn't have others, but there are 24 listed encounters here that you get as you move hex to hex to hex to hex to hex, trying to get back from the crash site to the Moraes. There's some great encounters. Uh, Terry will send robots against you. There are natural things like toxic plants uh, and animals here um, that will, uh, you know, become involved uh, in uh, the party. There are cliffs. Uh, they're fording rivers. There's all kinds of stuff that the party is going to have to get in through as they're racing against time to get back. And remember, they're, you're going to start to get negatives uh, for not sleeping or anything like that. And it is set up uh, very nicely in the beginning of what Terry is doing pretty much hour by hour almost through his 35 hours. So as the characters are moving through and you have to keep a log per hex of what time it is and what they've achieved as the, the game master. And then you kind of compare it to what Terry's doing. And then you, it, once, if you get back early and you make a really good run, uh, you might catch Terry very early before he's you know, converted more of the uh, security into defense. He's overly trapped things. He's moved a lot of the personnel around that he's captured that he can use against the players uh, to say that he'll kill them uh, if they come close to the Marais. Um, so you have to kind of judge that where Terry is in the process of getting out of here versus where the characters are and how hard they can push themselves against their stamina without sleeping, without resting, if they choose to, to get back. If they take their time, maybe the ship takes off. It's got a 60% chance of blowing up as it takes off because he's um, not overhauled the engine correctly and then they're trapped here anyway. So keep those things in mind. It's a really good race against time. Like I said, 24 encounters. A uh, great wilderness section that gives you all kinds of things that you can run into along the way. Uh, you know, heavy forests, cliffs, thickets, all kinds of stuff that the characters are moving through. And they're going to have to try, like, find their way around, plot their way around, try to get away through this to get back to the Marais. 
Um, and then finally, once you get back to the Marais, you have to be able to recapture it from Terry and everything that he's set up against the characters. This guy's on drugs. He's trying to keep himself up. Uh, he's going to be a really whack uh, kind of uh, uh, NPC enemy boss. Uh, and he could be a lot of fun. He doesn't really communicate with the characters during their trip, but he could be kind of like a Mad Hatter guy once you get back there as he's just cooked out of his mind after going 30-odd hours straight, worrying about the party getting back to him while he's trying to overhaul this engine, while he's dealing with people that he's captured, um, and the overall onus that he wants to keep this world safe. So you've got a lot going on here, but like I said, it's step, 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 step. If you're moving this along correctly, you can do encounter, encounter, encounter very quickly if you're at a convention. Or if you want to take your time with it, you can move it along day after day after day. Uh, in actual gaming, really, it's just uh, you're moving a hex an hour in the game. So keep that in mind as you're moving through it. Um, again, it's a, it's a fun adventure. I think it's well set up. If you like wilderness encounters, if you like exploring new worlds, and also if you like to limit what your characters have, when the crash happens, they can just grab a couple of things as they try to get to their gliders and get the heck out of there or they're gonna go down with the ship. The ship crashes, you know, there's all kinds of damage um, and therefore they don't have all the items that they normally have. So they're trying to get through this with what they've got, um, which uh, not only limits them, which I know characters can be peeved about, but it helps you as a, D as a game master to uh, go through the, the module and, you know, so they're not just wa walking through everything with their high class gear. So keep that in mind. Um, so they're taking care of that. Like I said, this is the first part of a three part series for Nighthawks. Although Nighthawks isn't really vested in this, it's really more of a, uh, an Alpha Dawn expanded um, rule set. Um, and of course I always play it. I play it in Zebulons, which I think works fine too. Um, nevertheless, I, you know, and again, every time I do Zebulons, it has such a, a higher level of skill sets and skills available to you that that works well here uh, when you're moving through different terrain. If you have people who are explorer class, um, they will have a lot more fun here than let's say doing other adventures because they're going to be able to utilize a lot of their skills like animal handling and stuff like that. So keep that in mind. Um, easily convertible uh, because a lot of the threats in here um, just have base uh, stat lines that can be uh, you know, convert it over easily to Zebulons if you're looking to do that. So anyway, uh, I'm going to give this a thumbs up. Uh, I really like this adventure for what it's put out for. And I really love the artwork in here. Tramp uh, just kills it. Every time I see it, he makes me want to play more uh, Star Frontiers and do more work for it and create more things for Star Frontiers. Uh, which I wish I could, but you know, those licenses, those dang licenses. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching uh, this on Thursday. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed it. And uh, please subscribe. Uh, please hit notifications if you can. We went over 100 subscribers, which is fantastic, uh, on our last video for Middle Earth. So hopefully we'll get some more here out of Star Frontiers. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you soon, hopefully, and great gaming.